Well, welcome everybody and thank you for attending the second um, uh, talk in our series, Trim's Talk, on a 20 series. So that's quite a number of years. But in very different circumstances to what um, they've been most of the time. If there is a fire alarm and uh, anything we need to remove ourselves quickly from this room, we must go this way. Please don't go that way because, as you know, it's all narrow and difficult. And if you go this way and turn left, there's um, a stairway down into the yard. So please come with me. And at the end, could you not all leave together? Rebecca will pop in and, um, and tell you, you know, to leave in certain order so we don't uh, all squeeze up in the door. And um, on the programme, I'm very pleased. So the programme is uh, eight talks. I'm very pleased to welcome um, Professor Michael Chisholm. Um, was Professor of Geography at uh, Cambridge and we got to know each other, I think because of Michael's interest in later years of uh, in the Fen map and the Crow map and all these, all these things. And um, it's been very interesting indeed. And um, Michael's come on the train to... Were there many people on the train, Michael? Not a huge number. No. <laughs> but more than I have thought might be. Um, Michael's talk is called a natural Fenland river made by Anglo-Saxon monks. Is there a question mark there or not? No. No? Uh, so it's, an Ang it's a natural Fenland river made by Anglo-Saxon monks. Sounds very interesting. So, Michael, thank you, and over to you. Thank you, Paul. I'm delighted to be back here. Yes, that is the correct title. And what I will be wanting to do is use that as a peg to show that we need to think about particularly the peak fenland in a, a way very different from the way we've been accustomed to doing. In the literature about the fens, the Anglo-Saxons in general have been written out. Um, it was long thought that any significant engineering could only have been done by the Romans or by the Normans after the conquest. And that the Anglo-Saxons uh, did nothing in the Fens of any significance. And probably many of you uh, will be aware that the sea bank, which uh, was created quite early, used to be called Roman Bank. Mm. And that was an attribution that <coughs> Sorry about that. That was an attribution that goes back to the uh, 18th century, maybe even to the 17th century, and in a belief that has only in very recent years been overturned. Darby, in his 1940 book of the medieval Fenland, portrays the uh, peat fens as being a wilderness relieved only by a plethora of eels. That's a very brief thumbnail <coughs> summary of what he thought. And <coughs> oh, <we're trapped>. <laughs> I'll try not to do that again. <laughs> um, as I a symbol of the attitude towards the Anglo-Saxons in the Fens. 1978, this book was published by Sir Harry Godwin, uh, an eminent scientist at Cambridge, um, and it's entitled Fenland, an Ancient Past and Uncertain Future. And in it, he summarizes what was then the collective wisdom. Utterly inhospitable throughout the whole of the Anglo-Saxon time. Marshland was deserted after 450. There were a few doomsday settlements there, but it was deserted, according to him. And there seems to be no evidence of Anglo-Saxon construction of waterways. That's pretty emphatic, and it represented the received wisdom about 40 years ago, which is not very long. 
since then, <coughs> um, attitudes and evidence have been changing quite dramatically. And I want to um, pick that up and then expand by talking about a particular waterway. But the reason for changing attitudes very largely is because of archaeology. Uh, after the war, planning rules meant that major developments require an environmental, archaeological investigation before you are allowed to build. The quantity of archaeological evidence has mushroomed in the post-war years. And secondly, very important, techniques available to archaeologists and in particular, the ability to give absolute dates. Carbon 14, I think will be a familiar term, using uh, organic materials, you can date, and therefore you can date the finds that are associated with that organic material. Uh, and so absolute dating, available really only since the war. The channel that is the title of this talk is shown on the map that you have there, is the colored map, not the black and white one, the colored map. You'll see a channel which, let me now find my own map, is labeled, it is in the western part of the map, from Peterborough, uh, labeled Cat's Water, Old South East, and Shire Drain. Have you all got that? The significance of those three channels together is that they form, and have formed for a long time, the county boundary of Cambridgeshire, up against Northamptonshire on the one hand, now Peterborough um, uh, Unitary Authority and Lincolnshire. A county boundary from Peterborough to the sea formed by those three channels. The significance is that county boundaries were settled for all practical purposes by about the year 1000, give or take. So, those three waterways existed um, before the Northern Conquest. That's point number one. Point number two, there is no evidence that they were constructed, or existed rather, at the time of the Romans. There is no evidence that they existed at the time of the Romans. And so it has been assumed Sorry, when I say there's no evidence that they exist at the time of the Romans, I, I, I'm taking a heavy myself. Because they existed around about 1000, because the Anglo Saxons couldn't do anything, uh, it was widely assumed that these must be natural waterways. And at one level, that seemed not unreasonable because. After the conquest, it is absolutely clear that Cat's Water and Old South were important to navigation. No doubt about that. So I begin uh, with Cat's Water, and on the other sheet that you have, which is uh, grey and um, other colour, geological map. I want to draw your attention to Cat's Water, which is running from south to north uh, through, roughly speaking, the middle of the uh, diagram. And you'll see at the southwestern end of Cat's Water, Flag Fen Museum. You all found that? Flag Fen Museum on Cat's Water. The significance of Flag Fen is that it's a Bronze Age settlement. Uh, it's rather 
same as one, and some of you may not be men, you see it one time in the past. There was a lot of archaeological work done on Flag 10 uh, in the uh, 1990s or thereabouts, including some trenches going down and digging down. And those trenches show categorically that there was never, ever a natural river flowing past Flag 10. Categorically, according to archaeological evidence, it wasn't. At the time of the Bronze Age, it was a minor stream, a local ditch, or not much more than that. The second feature, as you go north along Chat Water, you'll stay near the top of the map, you'll see the place called Neen Terrace. But if you look closely, Chat Water has crossed onto and then over a ridge of sands and gravels. If you pick up in the keys at the bottom, uh, the NS, um, uh, uh, NS, sorry, um, uh, symbol, that stream is going over a ridge. <coughs> it's gone uphill and then downhill. That is no natural uh, river. And the solution to that from the archaeological evidence is that there was a canalization of tap water and a linking of it to the river Neen to create a distributary. Not a natural one, but an artificial one, taking Neen water as far as what we now know as Neen Terrace. Categorically, one can say that tap water was artificial. There is no evidence that it was created by the Romans. There's no evidence of Roman activity on it at all. Therefore, it's got to have been done by the Anglo-Saxons at some point after the Romans left and the country settled down to post-Roman rule before the Normans arrived. It's got to be the case. Given that time is limited, I won't talk about Old South East, but I will jump to Shire Drain, which is the northern end of those three channels, uh, flowing into the sea. If Shire Drain had been a natural waterway of some magnitude, as it would have been by that time, it was that far down, there would have been an estuary. Rivers had estuaries when they get to the sea. And there would have been uh, the so-called Rodons, which you may have heard about, like you have at Upwell and Outwell, where the river has deposited sediments on its way to the sea. There is no estuary evidence. There is no Rodon for Triagrade is really quite extraordinary that people thought of it as being a natural river. So if Cat's Water on the one hand and Shire Drain on the other uh, have to be um, artificial, Old Southie in between, likewise, and there's in the, you know, direct evidence there uh, geologically that it's not a natural river in the way that it flows. So the starting point for uh, all of this is that that supposedly natural river uh, that people accepted, artificial. Not Roman, any of it, therefore Anglo-Saxon. And that is the key starting fact that we need to have. That raises some very interesting questions. And this is where I want to, as it were, take the, this one channel as the peg on which to hang a 
much, much larger swarm. Right? So that's the reason for the mechanical lure, you know. Um, if it were, as has to be the case, an Anglo-Saxon enterprise, who did it and why? And what else might they have done? And that is where the coloured map is of significance. Because what I have done, building on a certain amount of publication uh, in the last few decades, uh, and a bit more, is to try to start with the question, OK, we've got one major natural river that's not a natural river, Anglo-Saxon. What else might they have created by digging new di uh, rivers or drains or diverting rivers or drains? How much of this can be attributed to the Anglo-Saxon? the purpose of this map, and you will see that um, King's Lynn doesn't figure in the Anglo-Saxon time. Uh, that's uh, off out in the wilderness, as it were. The Ouse and the Neen join forces to flow out at Rizbeach, draining the Ben. And the blue is my attempt to identify the main natural um, waterways that there are. The red and the brown, the brown is the right colour, show the artificial uh, channels. The red, my understanding, wholly artificial, and the brown, canalised, natural. But that's significant engineering. <coughs> so the view that I now have, <coughs> since I first suggested the title for this talk, is that something like 150 miles of channels were created by the Anglo-Saxons um, in the bend, mostly in the peat bend. And one of the most dramatic examples if you focus on the middle of the map, you can see the city town of Marsh. And the natural mean coming from Benwick, a bit further south, the natural mean used to flow west of Marsh to somewhere near Elm. When I can get back into the University Library in Cambridge, I'm going to be able to hope to get that channel inserted, the natural one. You can see that's a major diversion to take the whole of that branch of the river Neen uh, through Marsh and to uh, join the Ouse um, that all crosses the same point in the Alan Area, uh, and up now uh, come out of the sea at Wisby. The, um, the answer to the question of who might have done all of this and why lies in the abbeys. And the point about the abbeys are uh, multiple. <coughs> there are five Benedictine abbeys that were established in the Fens around about the year 970. Got Crowland, Ely, Peterborough, uh, Ramsey, and Thorny. Within a matter of a few years, these were established either on re-establishment after the uh, desolation of the, the Viking uh, events, uh, or a new foundation, as I think was the case maybe with Crowland, um, Benedictine. And the extraordinary thing is that the full significance of Benedictine abbeys has been lost on scholars, put it bluntly. King Edgar was the first king of England ruling a peaceful uh, country um, 
past a wall uh, between Mercia and the East, Ang East Angles and the Northumbrians and all the rest of it, in which the Fens had been a frontier area. The Fens were essentially a frontier area during those battles. Edgar <coughs> had three major uh, advisors. Um, uh, who were powerful men in their own right, rich men, and they, the four of them, wanted to reform religious practice in this country. And they wanted to do so uh, really as a part of state building, that there could be a proper good religion for England. So Benedictine monasteries mostly male, but some female, were established. About uh, 30 uh, male uh, Benedictine abbeys in the country. And they were, in serious degree, showered uh, with resources. Um, and these resources were gifts by the king or one or one of the three uh, advisors, um, uh, Ethelwald, Oswald, um, lost the third one at the moment. And the resources that were in, amassed were not just estates in the Fens, but also further afield. And it is thought that. Uh, Round about, well, at the time of the Doomsday Survey, time of the Doomsday Survey, for the monastic houses in the country at large, so this is Benedictine plus non-Benedictine, um, they own between one-sixth and one-quarter, one-sixth to one-quarter, of the landed wealth of England. Now, that's a huge concentration of wealth uh, in the hands of a small number of, relatively a small number of religious houses, more than 30, of course. And at the time of Doomsday, uh, Ely was the second wealthiest abbey in the country. Glastonbury was the, the wealthiest down in Somerset, but Ely was number two. And if you put Ely, Peterborough, and Ramsey together, three of the Fenland Abbeys were among the 13 wealthiest in the country. That's a considerable concentration of uh, resources. The further point that has only really uh, in recent times become clear with uh, work particularly by uh, Professor John Blair of Oxford, and he published uh, in 2018 a substantial tome, it is a tome, it's like that, um, Building Anglo-Saxon England. Um, and it summarizes what is now the um, typical accepted understanding that the late Anglo-Saxon period was one of commercial economy. There was a lot of self-sufficient farming going on, but fundamentally, we must think of the late Anglo-Saxon period as a commercial economy and cash, uh, money changing hands. And there's a very good example of that is Ely, and a, a very important paper by a guy called Rory Naismith on six, five plus one, fragments, a single parchment that got divided into six different fragments, bound into six different volumes in different libraries, um, recognized for quite some time to actually be fragments of a single document, and he has written a, 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 a really quite powerful piece about the significance of these uh, documents, which date from 
the early 1100s, about the, uh, uh, 10 hundreds, about 1006 to 1036, so it is very shortly after the con uh, before the conquest. Uh, so it's truly Anglo-Saxon period, um, and the, it's uh, they are accounts, records of transactions, records of the easy messen officials visiting Alvar. It's an interesting lesson. I use my hand when I'm talking much more than I have realized. <laughs> um, and um, that's, I have to try and control that. Um, but these transactions are down at minute kind of detail. Ely helped Fawley as abbey. So by the gifts or loans, we don't know which, of specific things, uh, this number of um, sums of money for boats, uh, to be a fishing, for example, uh, or a slave being given. This kind of detail uh, in these documents, which is um, a, a striking illustration of the way in which the uh, monasteries were managing their estates at a high level of detail. So we have to think of the Benedictine monasteries as not just austere um, religious doctrines and observance, safely tucked away from the world in the fens to contemplate uh, the godly and leave aside the worldly, that has been the image, but it's wrong. It is plain wrong. Mm. They were running what, in terms of the time, were big businesses. They were, they were in, into business in a big way. Um, their landed estates scattered. Scattered uh, not only in the fens, but scattered um, in the rest of the country. A lot of coming and going. A lot of coming and going. And in the fens, Ely in particular, by the time of Doomsday, owned virtually the whole of the Peak Fens. Ely, along with Ramsey, uh, to a small extent, um, Crowland um, and, and, and Thorny. Um, the fens, the peat fens, were sewn up by the monasteries. And so we have to visualize a period, and I think it may have been a fairly short period, in which the abbeys were cooperating. The post-Norman literature about the Fens uh, emphasizes the conflict. Mm -hmm. I'm Ely, you're Peterborough, we're fighting over uh, issues, we're going to court and all the rest of it. But from about 970 to around about 1000 or maybe somewhat after, one man, Esselwald, had uh, a, a particular direct interest in three of the abbeys. Uh, Ely, Peterborough, and Thorny. Um, Oswald, uh, one of the advisors, uh, was uh, Ramsey, and I'm forgetting the name of the other advisor to, um, to uh, the king, who um, had Crowley. But there was this sense of the, well, actually, Adam, at the point, a long-standing tradition 
by the time of the late 10th century was that the abbey had certain social responsibilities. Um, they were exempt from tax in return for giving the king hospitality when he was on travel and funding, providing for defensive castles and bridges. That's a certain amount of social work. We have to think of the abbeys, the Benedictine abbeys, in the late Anglo-Saxon period as agents of the crown. Now, this is a view which is, you can find in the literature, but to pull it out, and it begins to have a resounding significance um, in a way that, quite frankly, has not been appreciated in the past. So, the, starting with that one artificial channel, which actually not natural, as we have thought, but artificial, um, and then looking at the Fens as a whole, we can begin to see uh, the peak fens in a new light. Uh, and uh, I will claim categorically it is a new light, and I will claim categorically, and I shall explain it on the details there, it's not one that Anglo Saxon historians are shouting at me saying, You're wrong. As far as I've been able to explore, I say, Actually, had a boy, <laughs> which uh, is quite nice. The significance is at a number of different levels. First, that the Anglo-Saxons did actually do quite a lot of hydrological engineering. The waterways that I've uh, indicated, 150 miles, give or take, um, is one thing. Embankments, sea defense, which thought to be was thought to be Roman bank, now known to be Anglo-Saxon. Uh, but the peat fens, I'm oh, sorry, the silt fens, were also protected from freshwater floods. And if you take my map, the colored map, you will see um, just west of West Beach, you can see Clutch Cross and Guy Hearn. You can see Clutch Cross and Guy Hearn, two towns on a colored map. Uh, and between them, Fen Dyke. Well, Fen Dyke, uh, I'm quite clearly a, an Anglo Saxon construction. And one of the things which has gone wrong in the literature, uh, quite blunt about this, is that one needs to think of waterways as dual or multiple purpose. Mm -hmm. And the dual purpose is very evident, Fen Dyke. It marks the edge of the silt fens for the peat fens further south, west. It provided an essential transport link uh, to complete the transport link from Crowland along Old South Reef to get to Whitbeach, which was the only uh, port of significance in the lot um, at that time. Fenderite would have been created for transport purposes as the primary. But if you were digging, a channel on the edge of the silt fens, you're digging out solid material. And where would you put solid material other than throw it up? Yeah. It's the, you're not going to cart it off and dump it out at sea. Now, I am convinced that the creation of Fen Dyke was associated with a bank that was protecting the silt fens from freshwater floods. And the archaeological evidence is that, yes, the silt fens were protected by the Anglo Saxons from sea floods from the north and also from freshwater floods from the south. 
And that links back to this title work that we examine. Think of waterways as a dual purpose and be very clear that the word dike is a, an interestingly a problematic one. <coughs> it has two meanings, um, a ditch and the bank. Uh, and it can mean either or both. Dyke as a word has its origins meaning a ditch. And the first use of the word dyke to represent a bank is in the context of a bank being formed by throwing up the waste from a, 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 a ditch. <coughs> Um, so that's one aspect of uh, the implications that the Anglo-Saxons really did do <coughs> quite a lot of work in a way that has not been fully understood and has, its significance has not been fully understood. It has an impact on the history of canal building in England. Um, John Blair uh, edited a volume in 27, 207 about canal building in England. <coughs> he refers to that material in his later book. And he views the 11th century as the first canal era in England. It's quite clear to me that it's actually the 10th century between about 970 and about 1000, that's when the canal era, first canal era began, which is also quite passing interesting. It has a further significance that um, the history of the Anglo Saxons in this country has in many ways been obliterated either accidentally or deliberately. The deliberate obliteration was by the Normans. Um, the Anglo-Saxons did build a number of churches in the stone. They also built churches for timber. The abbeys, the five abbeys I've mentioned, they built stone churches during the Anglo-Saxon time. This was one of the things that happened. And then we had um, Berry St. Edmunds uh, from about uh, 1020 doing exactly the same thing. These churches were for the most part either torn down or incorporated in the bigger Norman structures. The evidence for uh, the Anglo-Saxon stone building, almost entirely, not quite, but almost entirely written out. The, there are no Anglo-Saxon hordes, no boat burials in the fens that I'm aware of, so you don't have that kind of thing. And on the whole, uh, the Anglo-Saxons were not clear in a great deal of land of forest and so forth. They were inheriting what had been happening in the uh, Iron Age and the, the Romans. Um, they, they left rather little on the landscape for us to recognize as Anglo Saxon. And yet, if you look at the fens, and in particular now I'm thinking of the peat fens, and do so with the right eyes, one can see the record of the Anglo-Saxons in more places than you might think. Um, I've mentioned March. You, I mean, you, you actually go and see the river, uh, bridge in the centre of March, uh, and you can see the river that the Anglo-Saxons dug. That's a very clear. The diversion of the River Mark. Uh, going up to uh, Ferris and Edmunds. And that diversion still flows uh, from uh, 
I have a home to prick willow, you can go and see that. The Lodes, the Cambridgeshire Lodes, down in the south, which are A, B, C, D, and E at the bottom, mm -hmm. bottom right, uh, may not be exactly on the Anglo Saxon alignment, but they're all Anglo Saxon, they're not Roman, uh, and they are still functioning to the present day, partly as drains of land water being taken to the river. Um, partly in some pretense of navigation, they're mostly uh, tied up for houseboats, um, but they're, they're there. Um, but if you go a little bit further along, I go to, go to Crowland, which you can see is top left, and what I call Crowland Cut. Um, uh, that road, that, that channel, exists to the present day as a road from Neen Terrace to Crowland, about a two mile, less than two mile stretch of road, mm -hmm. running between uh, Neen Terrace and Crowland, with a part of it a substantial drain on one side. So you've got the relics in the landscape there of uh, the uh, significant waterway which no longer exists. If you see over on the western side of the map, Yaxley and uh, Wickersea Mere, you'll see Canuts Dyke, Canute's Dyke. That exists today as a minor road. Uh, and the point about roads is that when you've created a bank in a wet environment, that's the way you move around on land. Uh, particularly when there are some floods around. So the, the tally, and I, I won't bore you with the details, but the tally of small features that one can recognize as recording not an existing Anglo-Saxon structure, but the evidence of what used to be there uh, in the landscape is surprisingly large uh, in, the, in the peak bed. And I'm tempted to say larger than you'll find anywhere else in the country. Mm -hmm. so, perversely, as it may seem. Uh, uh, um, don't want to be quoted on that, but I, I, that's a feeling that I have. Mm -hmm. um, so, starting from that one channel, I'm actually rewriting the history of the Fens in a significant degree. And I want, where well, the time is uh, running on, <coughs> I want to close. Um, Paul, you may be familiar with uh, Hallam's work on um, the, the Allo, Watson Kenneth of uh, Lincolnshire in his uh, 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 classic work. Um, the rest of you probably not. But in Lincolnshire, um, not in Cambridgeshire, not in Norfolk, um, Hallam in the post-war published some very important work on the history of enclosure of land uh, in the western part of the Silk Fens, uh, not very far well, between them. Uh, up in the north you can see uh, Kid St. Mary, Gedney, Holbeach, Botlow, Spalding. Uh, the land coming down to Old Southie, um, that area of the Fens, and the basic thesis is that you've got Anglo-Saxon settlements like Holbeach and Botlow, Anglo-Saxon sea defence um, further south of the coastline shown there, um, and a little bit before the Congress, but mainly after for a couple of centuries, progressive southward intake of land for arable farming, and his basis of his work is a series of parallel banks running roughly east-west, each bank uh, understood to be a defense against freshwater floods um, to allow arable farming 
further north, and then common grazing further south. The problem with that interpretation is that Old South is an Anglo-Saxon structure, and there would have been a bank created along the edge of the field plain. And my reinterpretation of Hallam's work is not that these banks were protecting against floods, but rather they were the result, a byproduct, of digging ditches to keep livestock out of the arable and on the fen. And his evidence of what was happening good, his interpretation, I think, mistaken. Mm. Um, and the, this is coming back to the multiple purpose of waterways. Um, any of you familiar with Monmouth Marsh? No, that's the answer. Mm. Um, a long history of sheep farming and cattle grazing. A long history that you've got ditches and drains. And in Romney Marsh, a ditch or a drain of the order six feet, eight feet wide, we call them wet fences. Hmm. A wet fence. Uh, and I've collected up some ancillary uh, information on all of that, and we can, we can talk about it in a moment. Uh, what I am convinced was happening in the silt plains, and certainly that bit of uh, literature I've just identified, was that those banks which exist in silly landscape were not water defences, but um, the result of uh, uh, defences against livestock. Uh, by virtue of a water channel. It would also have been navigable. You would have had direct access to where you wanted to be. So, um, I'm in the process of, uh, of writing a book about all of this, but from what you might describe as small beginnings uh, grow you know, that oak tree. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I think that um, uh, I, I can now see the nature of that tree in a way that uh, a year ago I, I was still feeling my way around. I think at that point, Paul, I will close, and I'm very happy to uh, take questions and comments. And uh, I don't know whether those remotely uh, listening in to all of this are able to post questions via Rebecca, but if so, they might be brought through, I hope. But anyway, uh, I'll, I'll pause then. Thank you, Michael. Well, we do have it's 10 to, so we do have a bit of a time for any questions to Michael. Anybody? I'm very aware of water as um, a defence from living in Cambridge, and many of the early boundaries, as for example, around St John's College or the, the hospital, yeah. of water. Yes. And of course, you. Um, you didn't want to get yourself all mucky to climb back into your college. You didn't, you didn't wade through no. that. With anything mentioned to that. But there's that whole bit of um, South Lincolnshire where the village names can stretch for something like 20 miles, particularly around, around Gedney. Yes. And um, is that part of, of, of your um, research? Well, that exactly, uh, Gedney and uh, the, the other ones, um, if you take uh, Bot Road and Holby, yeah. uh, all of the parishes uh, in that part of the Fens are extraordinarily long. We're talking about six miles, eight miles, mm -hmm. as they took in land further and further down. Um, so, yes, I mean, absolutely, uh, uh, that's part of that pattern. Is there any, uh, do you have, what is your view about the diversion of the uh, River Ouse? Uh, who did it? Uh, was it uh, the monks uh, from yeah. the abbeys uh, when it came from the outlet uh, to Kingsley where it is today? The, the question, if we refer to the McCullough map, 
uh, is when did the ooze get diverted to uh, reach what is now King's Lynn? Um, my understanding is uh, 1100s uh, is the most likely period when that happened, number one. Number two, uh, if you can imagine the ooze and the neem waters all ending up at Wisbeach, you can imagine that there's an awful lot of sediment is being brought down, and some of this gets put out sideways, and the channel gets longer and longer. Uh, the water wants to start finding another way to the sea. And I think it's absolutely clear that what began to happen at some time uh, after the Norman Conquest was that water from uh, what is outwell began to move eastwards as it, the outlet to Wisbeach was getting more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. So that's element number one, a natural process. It does seem, but there's no certain documentation, that that was aided and abetted. Uh, and it, it, it apparently, from one source at least, aided and abetted by the people living in Littleport. Mm -hmm. uh, as the uh, artifact, as it were. So whether um, monastic, I don't know, uh, but since this is a territory that was basically owned by monasteries, and they must have been at least aware if they didn't actually directly help. I, I don't know that I can say anything more than that. But it, it, it of course, completely changed the dynamic uh, and made King's Lynn possible. And to add a footnote to that, Michael, um, the Ely estates, the bishops of Ely, had a gigantic estate, and they were sending goods out, cash economy, yes. commercialisation. And they took carts overland to London with lots of boats stuff, but they wanted an outlet to the sea. So I think Ely, in particular, mm -hmm. had a lot to do with this, as they did with the foundation of Cambridge University. You know, the bishops of Ely, later on, are certainly very key characters in the development of our region. And earlier on, they wanted outlets to the sea. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, many people from all these places Michael's been talking about used to fly the 12th, 13th century were coming to Lee Mark and buying the goodies to take back, including from universities where it got going. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a big link with Ely. Mm -hmm. well, and it's a huge a commercial operation, yeah, well, which the estate was. Sorry. Yeah. But, but that obviously links in with your views of it being a huge commercial operation in Anglo-Saxon times, so uh, Abbeys, because it, it would benefit them, presumably, with trade coming in to the sea yes. this way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and the uh, Bishop of Norwich, of course, uh, would have had an interest in helping a diversion uh, because it would be creating, helping yes. to create the facility uh, here for this town. Yes. How far he had a finger in, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> well, according <coughs> to some historians at UEA, he did, but you'd expect him to say that. But Lozinger certainly did have a part to play. Yeah. Because obviously they wanted Lee, because they owned the place more mm. or less. They wanted a town yeah. to get fatter and bigger and richer to yes. tax them. Yeah. So almost certainly uh, the, the, the bishops of Norwich as well. Because in those days, the estates were Norwich was Suffolk. It was Suffolk and Norfolk. And I think the Ely estate was probably, apart from Lincoln, the biggest and richest, wasn't it? It was a very big food producing area. Well, yeah. And they're very important. Well, um, thank you. For, just as a footnote to that, yeah. um, <coughs> the Abbey's took, as it were, I can use the word a rent use of land in the form of eels. Ely has how many eels per annum? 30,000. Go again. <laughs> 100,000 in a year. Mm. Now we didn't eat all of those. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, yeah, they, they would have been smoked, uh, salted, and they would have gone to London or elsewhere. Yeah. And well into the 20th century, this river here was full of eels. Mm -hmm. I mean, one old chap who died some years ago, he used to swim, and he did the old swim from um, the Wigan Hall down to Lee, which used to exist in the early, mm -hmm. early in the 20th century. He said he was swimming through eels a lot of the time. What's mm -hmm. happened to all our eels? Mm -hmm. But um, certainly a big trade, as Michael said.
Well, thank you very much. Um, next week it's Anne um, Judy Bloomfield talking about two families um, who um, um, lead chases and the Judy's. had a very big impact. Um, it's family history, but with a very much North End built dimension. Mm -hmm. And for example, um, the Coolies built the Pilot Cinema, which was demolished a few years ago. So it's family history with a very strong local you know, idea. And as part of her talk is, um, 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 do, uh, do different for changes in Coolies to North of family. If you have any spare change, we still um, got a box, which you'll see on the way out. Um, if you've got any spare coins, we've been very grateful. I go to Charitable Trust and Museum. We've been very supportive in the past. And um, I'd like to thank you for attending. And um, keep coming back when you can. And finally, Michael, thanks for coming to Cambridge. And every time you come, because of your research is in the Bend, your book on Crowland was a result of your research. You're breaking new ground, which I think is a very appropriate phrase. Michael keeps coming back and talking about his latest research. <laughs> and um, he was even chairman, or was it president, of the Spalding Gentleman Society <laughs> until a recent time, which in an antiquarian terms is a big thing in England, as important and, uh, uh, after the Society of Antiquaries of London. You know, So Michael's really got into this and breaking new ground. And I do think, I've always thought, that Anglo-Saxon history is not just, not just about fighting the Vikings, but they were hidden that they were, before the Roman Conquest, they were around for a for four, five, six hundred years. They must have done lots of things and developed lots of things. So um, our whole understanding of Anglo-Saxon in England, which should be taught for in school, what the Anglo-Saxons did, it's not just battles with the Vikings. And uh, so thank you very much, Michael, for sharing with us your research and thoughts. We look forward to the book. Um, that will be very interesting indeed. And um, we certainly enjoyed it. I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure other people did. So thank you very much for your support for True Shard. We were saying before we started, Michael wondered how many times he's been to True Shard, and uh, he's, cert he's certainly been at least four times. So thank you very much, Michael, for your support and for coming today. Well, thank you all for coming out in these uncertain times.